name is Jessica Sachs, and I grew up here. I grew up in the oldest city in the U.S. This is old for us, very old for us, 1565, right? Um, <laughs> and it's a beautiful, beautiful city. It's Spanish, and it's old. Uh, it has an old town, cobblestones. This is like a big deal for, for the U.S. We're like, oh, we have cobblestones. People visit this city, and they're like, this is novel. So. I'm fascinated with how things came to be, where they came from, and I'm really into it when it comes to tech. Does anybody else nerd out about old school tech? Vintage stuff? Do we all cringe collectively when we think about it? No? Um, it's just me. All right. So I want to look at, through the lens of history, why we end up where we do. Right? Why do we have so many test runners? And what are people actually trying to do when they build a new thing? Why do they feel like it, necess it necessitates change? So, hello. Hey, friends. I posted this on Twitter. I posted this on Twitter last week, and I got a ton of engagement. 178 distinct people responded to me on Twitter, not counting my DMs. And they told me about their back-in-the-day web dev stuff. I was trying to draw a line between where we started. You know, I started as a manual QA tester, like tapping buttons on iPads. I started there, got into Selenium, and that was about 2011. And I have no clue what happened before that. I was like, I think we still tapped buttons, but I'm not sure. And nobody else was either. <laughs> In this 178-person response thread full of like, people you would know on the internet, you know, library authors, authors of test runners that are old, not even the new ones, original node test runners, had no idea what happened before 2011. Like two people did, and I found them. And I found this breadcrumb trail where I could like, kind of explore and I went through so many Wayback Machine links, so many Wayback Machine links. Especially, I actually printed, there's no photo of this, I sent, it to, I sent it to Ben when I was prepping my talk. I printed 400 pages. I had gotten a new laser printer like the day before. I printed 400 pages of Wayback content from one of the original authors of a test runner we'll talk about. It's actually the first test runner that was able to launch a browser, watch it for file changes, and close it. It was very exciting back in the day. So I went, I did my research, I talked to a lot of people. It was hard to make this, but we have the timeline. And it's not documented most anywhere. But I did it, and I'm very excited. Also, uh, in the bottom right, there's some Easter eggs in this presentation. Does anybody know what that is? Hands. Very good. All right. So. I wanted to find out what was technically possible and when. That's the timeline. But like, what did people actually do? And that's what the 178 people told me, is what people tended to do around those times, regardless of what was possible. So back in the 90s, back in the 90s, we had this thing. I'd never heard of it before. It's called CGI. Yeah, you're laughing. Very good. He's my, he's my buddy now while I'm giving this talk. <laughs> so back in the 90s, we wrote web apps in C or Perl. And why is this relevant to testing? Well, ask yourself, how would you test a C application's business logic when it comes to rendering a thing on a route? How would you do that? And can you imagine how painful it is to like, dynamically render web content in C based on URL parameters? Like, Ow, ow. So how would you test it? First, by the way, if you're wondering, it is the cover of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album. It's just straight up, they grabbed it. This is the Wikipedia image for CGI, and I was like, this looks familiar. It is. Cool, so why do we care about CGI? Well, it's kind of like PHP, right? And RSCs are a thing. React server components, we're interested in how to test things like Next.js, like Nuxt.js. We're interested in things like Laravel. Similar shapes to similar problems. And history is like that. History is the same thing, same problems, maybe some variations. So if we pay attention 
to the question of how did we exactly test CGI in the 90s, maybe we can infer something about what we should do now. So we have a problem. We're building apps in the 90s, and we want to test them. And what do we do? We click buttons. We load up a web page on our webmasters computer. Webmasters were basically the product managers of the day. So you were a coder. Like, people didn't call themselves software engineers, right? You were a coder, and you walked over to your webmaster's desk, and you were like, I think this works. And he was like, let's check it on my monitor because monitors were mainly the problem at this point. And the other thing that was kind of nascent was the infrastructure. So people didn't actually care, for the most part, about functional correctness. Most of the issues for CGI development, and this scales to where I'm going to go with modern times, most of the issues with CGI development happened in the network layer and when it came to actually deploying code. So imagine this, you're, gonna, you're the coder here, and you're going to... FTP into production, you're going to open, did Vim exist? I don't know, you're going to open VI, and you're going to edit the source code in production and like figure out how to quit Vim. And then it's live and prod. And then you'll walk over to your boss's desk and say, hey, it's live and prod, does this look good? And your coworker emails you a zip file of the new source code they would like you to FTP over. Copy pasting isn't a thing, so you're looking, email, and you're looking at email and your terminal and just typing letter by letter. That's the problem back in the day. We don't have that problem now, but we do have the problem of network and infrastructure. And not in the sense of like, we have a hard time with Apache still. In the sense that edge is new, serverless is new, infrastructure is expanding in complexity. That is where a lot of problems lie. And so we still have similar problems to back in the day. And still the best way to make sure if your infrastructure is deployed correctly is to, and we'll get to staging environments in a second, is still to open up production as it's configured and be like, OK, is it fast, reasonably fast, and does it work? For complex, novel technologies, that's one of the best solutions, manual testing. Just do it. Don't feel bad. I'll tell you a story at the end of this talk about what Google did for manual testing. I had no idea until I researched this talk. All right. So we just covered the it works on my machine era, which I call from the beginning of the web, which James talked about, all the way to about 2004, where Selenium was released. Selenium is an end-to-end -end testing tool. Do people know what Selenium is? Hands? I like it. Um, Selenium was surpassed by Playwright, Cypress, Nightwatch. There's like five others. But we're not talking about end-to-end -end testing today. We're talking about other stuff. So we did that. Here are the other ones. The first browser war, 2000, 2004. These are the technical names, actually, for the browser wars on Wikipedia. The second browser war, 2000, <laughs> 2004 to 2007. Oh, I'm spoiling it. 17, excuse me, 2004 to 2017. We have automated JavaScript runners, 2007, 2017, and node-based runners and runtimes, about 2015. And finally, environment-aware runners, and that is what I'm actually really stoked about. That's what I did at, uh, at Cypress, was kind of look at how we can make bundlers and their test runners as close as possible. So this page is best viewed in Netscape or Internet Explorer. And this isn't actually a good example, because it would say Internet Explorer 5.5. That was what I was looking for. But. All right, so the first browser war, we have two interesting events. 2004, Firefox. Firefox became the best developer tool. And people faced pushback in switching to using Firefox's development tools and test tools. Right? Firefox added a lot to, back in the day, you had to view source to debug. You were looking at text. You had no breakpoints. You had alert, kind of. People had to manipulate alert because it wouldn't stringify things properly. And basically, managers were like, you're not testing on user devices. Nobody's running Firefox. It's on a different engine. And there was a lot of disparity between browser engines at the time. 
So managers are like, you're not, you're developing in Firefox, how are you gonna catch the bugs? And they're like, no, 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 standards bodies are a thing now. And they're like, standards bodies are gonna save the world? Nah, no, no, no. And if you go on webmasterworld.com, you, you can see back till 2000 what people were saying during the first browser wars and all of those tiny little discussion points. And they were like, I was right. Web browser standards did win. Haha, -ha, manager from 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, next, IE wins. Second, oh, one second. I view this as the inaccessible web. The thing that matters here with how people perceived what they should be doing in web development. People were like, okay, I want the best experience for IE 5.5 developers. That is my market. I don't care about Netscape developers. Sure, IE 5.5 is only 30, 40% of all web development, or sorry, web users. 30 to like 40% or something like that. It's, it was bad. And they were happy with it. They were like, all right, cool. But then people started using the internet. People needed to expand browser support. And Selenium came along and made that pretty possible. People also got better at making regression test checklists. Here's what I would say happened. We started regression testing with manual spreadsheets. People started to understand what continuous integration even was. Nobody's starting, we're starting not to FTP into prod at this point. Uh, Cruise Control was released in 2001 the first open source CI tool. Yeah, and we have little manual badges. The thing at the bottom here, those little, those little footers, that is what people t would do to be like, I'm cool. They would run in a website separately, manually, take this process, take their source code, the rendered output from their C websites and such, and paste it into a validator and then get a little image out and be like, yeah, I did it right. Now we have the second browser war. This is an independent, uh, independent illustrator. I did not get this from AI. So I was very excited about that. Second browser war, according to Wikipedia, looks something like this. I thought that was a little complex. So we're going to do that. Firefox, iOS Safari, Chrome is released in 08. And in 2017, Wikipedia said the second browser war has ended because the usage of other browsers is under 5%. In 2018, Microsoft con uh, concedes and says, yeah, we'll rewrite Chrome, or we'll rewrite Edge in Chromium. Next, we have the in-browser unit tests. So a lot of people believe a very lot of people, and I have a quote on this next, that there was no way to test in the browser in the late 2000s. They just didn't believe that this was possible. That's not true. It's just that nobody did it. People just didn't find value in it. You had things like, it, unit testing doesn't actually increase the speed at which I would deliver. But technically, technically, it is possible, and many people did do it mostly library authors for things like Bootstrap, jQuery, Scriptaculous. I heard the creator is like really proud of that name. Uh, Yahoo UI, UE, and I don't know if you're supposed to say it out loud, but MooTools. Um, and all of these libraries existed to add a better API onto the web and then also standardize in the absence of popular standards bodies having made it yet. And then also Firefox was a thing. Cause of death, Chromium 1 and better test runners exist, and now we have headless Chrome for automation. It's a big deal, especially for our end-to-end uh, -end test runners. So, the majority of those 178 people said, there's no way. And I think I got Ryan Florence and Mishko. So Ryan Florence, creator of Remix, Mishko, father of Angular, to be like, no, 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 there was a way? I don't remember the name of it, but we, we worked backwards. So here were some of the names of the test runners. UE test, and they were coupled to the um, utility frameworks that were released. So UE test from Yahoo was for Yahoo UI. Q unit was for jQuery from John Rizek. JS unit, and then Scriptaculous had its own test runner, mainly because it came from the Ruby community, which was really into testing. And the Ruby community with RSpec and Rails, 
said, we like test-driven development a lot. That's the TLDR of the Ruby community in testing. And so Scriptaculous had to ship some unit test runner. This was the other pushback around that time. Couldn't get buy-in, no velocity. Hmm. And then the thing that makes sense, this is the only thing that I'm like, this is in an inarguable position, is that actually the important code wasn't JavaScript. The important code you wanted to unit test, in particular, the business logic, was not JavaScript, because people didn't necessarily run JavaScript still. Kind of interesting. So all this changed when JS Test Driver was released. It was written in Java by Mishko, in, released in 2007 at Google. And it led the way, it was the first time that people could launch a browser from, in one command, launch a browser, and then see their tests execute, and have a file system watcher, and get the reports back in the terminal or IDE. It was the first time ever. And I'd never heard of this tool. It led the way for a test runner that I had never heard, I had never heard of while researching called Testacular. I'm not kidding. Has anybody heard of Testacular? Nice. It's a Google test runner. And <laughs> The joke is that it's spectacular test runner, testacular. And some people were like, I'm having a hard time uh, making this okay for where I work. Like, I want people to actually use unit testing, and this is, we're getting in the way of that. So Ryan Florence was like, hey, can we not? And they were like, yeah, good point. And that was it. It was like, it was the least controversial GitHub issue I've ever seen. Especially that Ryan put together, to like underscore that for anybody who's on Twitter. Um, so, automated JavaScript test runners in that time, mostly real browsers, like JS Test Runner spawns a real browser, Karma spawns a real browser, and then in CI, though, they got to use PhantomJS, and this little thing is universally disliked, um, except for the fact that it was the only tool that could do the thing, right? It was the only way you could run your JavaScript code headlessly in CI, until Node, and so... <laughs> Most people, though, got their ex first experience on Karma or Jest. And a lot of them had written tests before, but in JUnit or RSpec. So finally, um, node-based runners, people are fairly familiar with them, Node and Jest. I'm going to zoom through this because I'm over time. But node-based runners, namely Jest, overtook Karma. But I attribute the cutover onto node-based test running as the creation of JS DOM in 2011, there were a lot of disparate frameworks, like Mocha, which is the most popular. And then eventually, when Jest was popular enough, it overtook Karma in 2016. And it was open sourced by Facebook in 2014, and actually developed in 2011 internally at Facebook. This is about what it looked like. It had a fake DOM which isn't great, and we kind of come back to that at the end. And it was the first thing to really care about module loads, transforms, and, build start, and builds, because Webpack started to be a thing. Before that, we were concatenating script. You can find these slides online. I'm not going to go through these, because I'm over time. One of the really cool things, though, is our little badge thing still exists, except we use shields.io for it. Kind of an interesting history pushback. Finally, here we are. Here we are today. We have Bun, we have Dino, we have Vite, Vercel Edge Functions, Cloudflare Workers, AWS Lambda. JavaScript runs everywhere, and whether or not a file system is available isn't a given, right? Whether or not an execution environment will persist is not a given. Whether or not it's running Node, not a given. And Vite with ESM and TypeScript, I think that's what is going to kill Jest. Jest is still prevalent. You can see the green line here. But I think today, Vtest, with its focus on switching environment context, it doesn't just support JS DOM. It supports Happy DOM, another runtime, emulated uh, DOM browser. It has a browser mode. It runs in whatever browser you launch it in, just like Karma. And finally, it supports end-to-end -end runners for automation. So Vtest is the test runner and launcher. However, it does not control the environment. 
but it is tightly coupled to your bundler, which is business logic in today's sense. That was the main thing that just got wrong, it was a custom bundler. That's where it tripped up on TypeScript. And it, we have no way to know. It's not the fault of anybody. It just happens, right? We learn more. The environment changes. Suddenly, Svelte wants to have SFC files. And Jest is like, that's a lot of work to write a second compiler. So that's how we ended up where we are. That's why we have so many test runners. So many runtimes, bundlers matter. And we're compiling a lot of different stuff and things to put places. <sighs> I'm so over time. I'll give you the last tidbit. Android was not automated uh, in its QA at all. It was tested manually solely before release by Google. I learned this on a talk by Jason Huggins, who's the co-author co of Selenium. So I found that to be a very interesting confirmation that manual testing is good enough back then. It still is for a lot of stuff now. And if you want your team to adopt a new tool, it has to be fast enough for them to integrate into their workflow. Be patient with new stuff. It's cool. And if it's worth it, the tests will come. If you're doing something special, you might have to write it yourself. And that's all I got. Thank you.